Greetings! Welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel. Today we're doing the fourth installment in the Animal and Plant Breeding and Genetics series. This is a series intended to give you, a small farmer, the background information you need to make good breeding decisions relative to what you're raising, whether it's animal or plant, your goals and your situation. Okay. So this is information that would be contained in several collegiate level genetics classes and related classes condensed down to just kind of the core nugget in the middle that's directly useful to you as a small farmer. Now, these four do build on each other. I've said this at the beginning of each one. I'll say it again here. This video does depend on information which was presented in earlier editions of this series, right? The first is the overall basic backgrounds on what genetics is. The second has to do with outcrossing depression, inbreeding depression, heritability, um, all of those so population genetics, all those sorts of things. The third has to do with specific crossing patterns for breeding a line or a flock or a herd of something. The fourth, the one we're about to do, is all about outcrossing. Okay, so we're going to talk about hybridization and how hybridization fits in to other breeding ideas, how it builds on, how it feeds into, and how it complements other ways that you can breed your livestock and or your plants. Okay, so if at any point in this you feel lost or like I'm using words that you don't understand and haven't defined, it's because I've defined them in one of the earlier editions. Okay, so go back and you can watch those catch up and then you'll be ready for this. If you already have a background in this, you just want to jump right in with this particular video, go for it. Either way, I'm putting a link at the top of the screen to the playlist which contains all of this information collated in one spot for you. So, hybridization. Let's dig into it. Hybridization. This is a term that gets thrown around a lot and used as a synonym to a couple of others. So when people talk about wide crosses, they're talking about hybridization. When people talk about outcrossing, they're talking about hybridization. When people talk about breeding a horse to a donkey to make a mule, they're talking about hybridization. In short, a cross is a hybrid cross if the offspring increase in heterozygosity relative to their parents. Okay, So if the kids are more heterozygous in their genetic condition than the parents were, it's a hybrid cross. Okay, So it is it has broad meaning because it just inherently is a broad term. Right, when you're talking about line breeding or clan mating systems, you're talking about systems which tend to reduce heterozygosity, where you're selecting for a particular suite of traits and trying to get that suite of traits purebred, i.e. homozygous within that line or that family. Okay? Um, mob breeding tends to maintain heterozygosity. Uh, clan mating can maintain heterozygosity if you do it right, but it's a hybrid cross which increases heterozygosity. Okay? So just to blow through some terms here as quickly as humanly possible, we can have different types of hybrid crosses. Conspecific, this is just a word in science which means of the same species. If you Google conspecific hybrid cross, you're not really going to find much because usually when people are talking about hybrid crosses within the same species, they'll call it an outcross or a wide cross or they'll use one of these other breeding terms. But all of those things are conspecific crosses within the same species. So this would be, this would still be a wide cross. So if you are taking um, a Chihuahua and you are breeding it to a Newfie, <laughs> a Newfoundland Retriever, that would be a very wide cross. That would be a conspecific hybrid cross. Also would require AI. <laughs> it would require AI. Yep, yep. There's, there's, uh, there's issues there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> would definitely require artificial insemination. But... That would just be, just for, for a mental image of what a wide cross would look like, that's it, okay? Where you have two radically different lines that you're crossing 
to get a maximally heterozygous offspring. Okay. You can also have interspecific crosses. This means between two different species. Okay. A conspecific cross will always be fertile. All dogs will produce fertile offspring when bred, even if AI is required, when bred with other dogs. Okay. All horses will produce fertile offspring when bred with other horses. Right? All chickens when bred with other chickens. All corn plants when bred with other corn plants. Mm -hmm. okay? That's not true when we go to interspecific crosses. So, um, apple trees. All apple trees within the genus Malus are fertile. Okay? So, any two crab apples, apples, anything apples, will cross with each other when the bees do the job. They will produce apples, those apples will have seeds in them, and those seeds will grow, and the offspring of those seeds will also produce apples with seeds that will grow. They are fully fertile across the entire genus. Okay? Um, horses, not so much. Right, when you breed a horse with a donkey, there are two different species in the same genus. It's an interspecific cross, but you get a mule, and the mules cannot breed and make more mules. Okay? So it's not universal. It does happen, but it's not universal. You can have mammalian interspecific fertile crosses, right? All of the sheep are interfertile with all other sheep. All of the goats are interfertile with all other goats. Okay? You can also get some complex patterns out of this. So if you look at oak trees, they are subdivided into subgenera. So you, um, here in North America, we have the red oak subgenus and the white oak subgenus. Okay? All red oaks are interfertile with all other red oaks. All white oaks are interfertile with all other white oaks, but red oaks won't cross with white oaks. So you can have more complex patterns. You can also have even more complex patterns. So you have the uh, um, llamas and alpacas can cross. The females will be fertile, the males won't. And that cross is called a wari. Hmm. Okay. So you can have, when we go to interspecific crosses, and we're going to talk about all these in detail here in a couple of minutes. But when we go to interspecific crosses, Sometimes they are fertile, sometimes they are not, and sometimes it's just complicated. Okay? And then we can talk about intergeneric crosses. And these are relatively rare to be possible and fertile, but they do happen. So the beefalo, where you have a bison, which is in the genus bison, crossing with a beef cow, which is in the genus boss they produce a partially fertile offspring, the beefalo, okay? And again, the, uh, just like with the llamas and alpacas, it tends to be the females which are fertile and the males tend to be sterile. So we can have some of these same patterns happen within different genera. Now, there are some plants that will do this really well, like orchids will do a lot of intergeneric crosses and be fully fertile, but it's relatively uncommon for intergeneric crosses to be fertile. Um, when they occur in most mammals, they tend to be kind of a stunt more than a real agricultural practice. Like a liger, a lion, tiger cross, I'm sorry, that's a stunt, right? That's not something that we're going to do in agriculture, I don't care. Same thing with like goat across sheep crosses. Yes, it's possible with a lot of AI and careful laboratory procedures, but it's a stunt. It's not going to become a part of your livestock tradition. <laughs> you know? Um, it's so, way too expensive. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's dumb. It's, there's no, it's pointless, right? There's, there's, no, there's no purpose in it. So we're not going to worry about those. We're not, we're not dealing with stunts. We're dealing with things that can happen naturally and could actually be useful on your hobby farm or your small farm or your large farm, right? Now, We'll talk about all this stuff in more detail as we go forward. I just want to blow through the terms. Before we go to the next whiteboard, though, why would we want to produce a hybrid cross? Why do this instead of just doing selective breeding, as we've already discussed in earliest, earlier installments of this video series? There's a couple of reasons. First, 
we can invigorate a failing line. So if you have a line of livestock that, or plants or anything that is starting to fail, starting to suffer from inbreeding depression, a Y cross, con specific now, is a way to reinvigorate and restore the uh, usefulness of that line. Okay? This can also be called genetic rescue. So if you have a line of, of critters or plants that has basically been purebred for something terrible, which is a very common problem when people do line breeding badly, going wide for a conspecific hybrid cross, you can rescue that line and then breed back to the traits you're looking for. Okay, Has to be done right. If you don't do this right, you're just going to end up right back where you started. Um, but it is a thing. Genetic rescue can also be uh, like what the American Chestnut Society is doing, trying to produce a hybrid of the American and Chinese chestnut that is predominantly American. Um, that's also an example of genetic rescue, and in this case it's to avoid death to an introduced pathogen. Okay? So genetic rescue is a reason to do a hybrid cross. Introduce new traits. So you can't select for a trait that doesn't exist in your line. Obvious, right? So if, the, if, we want a, if we want a trait in our line of livestock or plants that is not already there, again, a conspecific or even interspecific hybrid cross can be a way to gain that. And both of these exist in livestock and plants that, you, that you're familiar with. Okay? Um, expanding heritability. This is again related, just like genetic rescue is um, related to invigorating a failing line, expanding heritability is similar to wanting new traits. So if you're selecting for the biggest something and you've made some progress and you run out of heritability, it's no longer heritable, it's no longer making progress, a wide cross can give you more heterozygosity and then you can restart your process of selecting for that trait. Okay. Um, assist with domestication. Uh, alpacas are an example of this. The wild ancestor of the alpaca, the guanaco, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the vi vicuña, sorry, guanaco is the wild ancestor of the llama. Vicuña is the wild ancestor of the alpaca. Uh, forgive my brain freeze there for a second. Um, is basically undomesticatable, but again, the worry cross I alluded to earlier allowed it to be domesticated, but it required some hybridization to do so. It's a really interesting example. And produce terminal crossing programs. Now this we're going to spend quite a bit of time on later on in this video. This is very, very common. So when you're looking at the hybrid sweet corn, hybrid tomatoes, hybrid peppers, all of these hybrid plants that you see in seed packs in the spring on, on, on seed racks. That's what this is. Um, and what's being done is the breeders are selecting for purebred traits in two different lines, but they're selecting for different traits in those two lines. Then when they cross them, because the traits they've selected for are dominant, the offspring exhibit all of the selected traits. But their hybrid, they won't reproduce that characteristic in their offspring because their offspring are going to be random assortment at hetero, of hetero, many, many, many heterozygous loci. It's a terminal cross. It doesn't go farther than that. You grow it for a year, they die in the winter, and then you buy more seeds next spring. Okay, that's a terminal cross. The, uh, like, broiler chickens are a terminal crossing program. And the uh, uh, multi-tier sheep agriculture in the Northern British Isles are a terminal crossing program. So this shows up in a lot of different forms of animal and plant husbandry, and we're going to spend some time on it. But it is, again, another example of using conspecific hybrid crosses. So I hope this gives you a, a, a little background on these terms. We're going to go to dig into some of the details. As mentioned previously, offspring from a hybrid cross can have a couple different possible statuses relative to their fertility. Some crosses, 
either are inviable, don't produce offspring at all, or only produce offspring under very, very carefully controlled conditions. We don't care about them. They're not going to be part of your breeding program. Others like horse and donkey mules are always infertile. That's a type of a terminal cross. We'll allude to it. We're not going to dwell on it. The uh, ones that we really care about are the ones that produce either consistent partial fertility or consistent full fertility. Most of what we talk about is going to be consistent full fertility. But these cases where you have consistent partial fertility are important and have and continue to impact many species that we raise domestically. Okay. So, is it fertile? Well, in cases of partial fertility, and usually this is where you have an interspecific or intergeneric cross. Okay. You're going to see that the highest level of fertility occurs in individuals that are homozygous with respect to the sex determining chromosome. Okay. So in mammals such as us, we have the very familiar XY chromosome pattern. Right? Males are XY, females are XX. And because the female is the homozygote, they tend to be fertile. Since the male is the heterozygote, they tend to be infertile. Okay? Birds and reptiles. Remember, birds are just warm-blooded feathered reptiles, right? Um, you have the WZ chromosome pattern. So the Z is equivalent to the X in mammals. It is the large gene-rich chromosome. The W is the reduced gene-poor chromosome that's almost gone. So the male is the homozygote in this case. ZZ is male, so it's backwards from mammals. Okay, You have to remember that whenever you're talking about sex-linked traits in birds. They work the same pattern as sex-linked traits in mammals, but they're reversed. And um, WZ is then female. So the male tends to be infertile in birds and reptiles. The female tends to be the infertile one. Okay? Now, there's a couple places that this comes up real big. You see this real big in terms of the history of, of chicken domestication, the history of um, the uh, uh, llama and alpaca domestication, and it is continuing to be a big deal in the development of the beefalo. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the beefalo here. You can go and buy beefalo meat at um, high-end grocery stores, and it's a cross between the cow and the American bison. Now this is really interesting because this is a mammalian intergeneric cross and that shouldn't happen. If you know anything about the genetics of mammals, they're real sensitive to really wide crosses between species, let alone between genera. But the bison directly descends from the yak and the yak is in the same genus as the cow so it really begs the question should we revise the taxonomy of these species right and that's its own separate question we're not going down that rabbit hole now but for the time being as currently classified this is an intergeneric mammalian cross okay um now what you do with this is you start obviously with an initial cross, right? We're going to take a female bison and we're going to take a male cow. And it has to be done that way. You can't flip flop it. If you put a uh, male bison over a female cow, you will see that the, the cow will conceive, will carry that um, conception for several months, will then mount an immune response against the infant, and they will both die. So the uh, the cow rejects the bison genetics so strongly that the female cow cannot carry the bite the 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 fifty fifty bison calf. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the reverse is very possible. The bison is a little more robust than the cow, so the bison don't care. So you're going to put a male cow over a female bison. Um they will breed. As expected, the females will largely be fertile, not 100%, but largely be fertile. The males are called and go to market. These are usually marketed as 
Catalo, the 50-50s, <laughs> okay? So the males are all infertile and, and um, going into the uh, food supply chain, okay? Now, the 50-50 mix, all your males are infertile. If you just go, you, you, you can take this female and back cross it to either species, right? And if you just go and you back cross, back cross, back cross, back cross, back cross, you will eventually restore full fertility. It's going to take more than five back crosses. And by the time you do that, you've basically reestablished whichever species you're back crossing to. It's going to be physiologically either for all practical purposes, full bison or for all practical purposes, full cow. Okay. And due to this reason and these occasional crossings, virtually all bison herds have at least a little bit of cattle genetics in it. Some conservationists think that's horrible. I'm not so sure they're right. Okay, Getting some of that domestic cattle in there, there are some advantages in terms of disease resistance and resiliency. I'm not convinced that that's a horrible thing, but some people hate it and actively try to do genetic testing and cull the cow-influenced individuals in those bison herds. I'm not convinced that's a good idea. Um, I think you'll see why till we get all the way through this, but um, it is a thing that's being done. Now, the uh, uh, really the to to make the beefalo, we want to have attributes both from the cattle and from the bison. The bison are, are very thrifty. They can exist on poor pasture. They have a higher follicle density, so they have more hair and they're more cold tolerant. At the same time, they can sweat where cattle can't and they're more heat tolerant. Hmm. So you get a, a much wider ecological niche in, in which they can sur survive than pure cattle. Okay, um, And they're better for market, easier to maintain. The, the true bison can't be truly domesticated they're, they're too ornery. They can be raised in a semi-wild condition, but they can't truly be domesticated, whereas the beefalo is a true domestic. So it's assisting the domestication of this other species. And um, we want them to restore full fertility before they get either, for all practical purposes, bison or for all practical purposes, cow. So we get a really interesting crossing pattern. You take these 50-50s, um, you cross them back to cow, so you get one quarter, or sorry, back to bison. So you get one quarter cattle, three quarters bison. Okay. These, the uh, uh, females are, again, all fertile. The males are sometimes fertile. Okay. Most of them are infertile in our culls. Some will be fertile, and you can use them in the next step where you take this three-quarter bison and cross it back over cattle. So you end up with five-eighths cattle, three-eighths bison, and all are fully fertile. Hmm. Now the danger is, again, this one-quarter cattle, when you cross that over, when you take these rare fertile males that are three-quarter bison, and you use them over domestic cattle females, again, you have the immune response problem, but you can usually get away with it once. So these fertile males end up being rare, but extremely valuable because farmers that want to raise um, beefalo, instead of ever having to raise full wild buffalo and do this whole process, they can buy one of these males. They can cross them over a whole bunch of domestic cattle females, get an instant herd of beefalo. And it's usually the second pregnancy where you see the problems. the problems come up, right? So you can get away with it once. Mm -hmm. So usually they're kind of used once and then sold off. Um, but all of the females from this are useful and can be crossed over, um, you know, crossed with male domestic cattle bulls, mm -hmm. okay? And then this 5 8 3 8 mixture is the finished beefalo. They're all fully fertile and you can go forth with whatever breeding program follows from that juncture. Okay? So this is just an interesting example of, in a very deliberate fashion, taking advantage of this partial fertility of this really wide hybrid cross. 
Now, a couple other examples where this partial fertility comes in in a big way, although in a different way, are the domestication of chickens and alpacas. Okay. So the South American camelids that give us the llamas and the alpacas are the guanaco and the vicuña. The guanaco is the direct ancestor of the llamas. The guanaco is very easy to domesticate. It's a very calm, very placid, relatively speaking, herd animal that fits the domestication syndrome perfectly. Okay? Directly domesticated becomes the llama. The vicuña is another story. They have much finer fiber. They're much smaller in size. Um, they can sort of kind of be raised in a semi-wild state, but not very effectively. And they are so gretzy, to use a little Pennsylvania Dutch there, right? It's cranky and grumpy. They are gretzy. And um, they can't be directly domesticated for the same reason that the zebra can't be directly domesticated, right? They're just too mean and gretzy, right? Um, so what happens is all of those are partially interfertile by a similar pattern, okay? So the hybrid of a guanaco and a vicuña, or a llama and an alpaca, or a guanaco and a llama, or an alpaca and, or sorry, a guanaco and an alpaca, or a llama and a vicuña, right? Any of those hybrids, the partially fertile hybrid is called a wari, and then it will get a prefix. Could be a llama, llama wari, or a you know, vicuña wari, or an alpaca wari, right? Depending on what it's most similar to. And after numerous five or more back crosses, it will just kind of revert to the original thing. And the uh, reestablish like the key traits of whichever species it was originally coming from. But it's not entirely that species. It's carrying some genetic introgression. Okay? So yes, if you take a worry and you back cross it to alpacas, you're basically going to get an alpaca, but you still have some genetics coming in from the other direction. Or likewise, if you take a wari and you back cross it to llama, it's going to basically return to being a llama, but it's going to carry some genes along for the ride. Okay? So it is believed, and I think there's still a little ambiguity over the details on this one, that the alpaca started as a vicuña wari was backcrossed, but then rebred to exemplify the small body size and fine fiber hmm. of the vicuña. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it's it's a case of this partial fertility uh, facilitating domestication of a critter which was otherwise not domesticatable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chickens are another interesting example. Again, the uh, there's four species of wild chicken. They're called the jungle fowl, right? The red jungle fowl, the gray jungle fowl, the green jungle fowl, and then the Sri Lankan jungle fowl. I guess it didn't deserve a color name. Anyway, mm -hmm. the, um, <laughs> the red jungle fowl is the ancestor, the direct ancestor of all modern chickens. But... There's a lot more complexity in there, right? White feet, the gene for white feet and legs only is found in the gray jungle fowl, okay? Um, some of the characteristics of the uh, Egyptian Faomi breed and a couple other related breeds from the Middle East have characteristics that are only found in the Sri Lankan jungle fowl, okay? And then the uh, genes for long crowing, the laughing chickens, if you've ever seen them, those funky crows, they're fun sounding, yeah. Um, long feathers, uh, the fibro gene, which gives them the black skin and flesh. Uh, what else? Um, Non-molting gene of the Onigodoris. So a lot of those genes are only found in the um, Galsvarius, the uh, green jungle fowl. Okay. So clearly, there's been some funny business in the history of our chickens, right? And um, the Gallus 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 Various hybrid, called a Becassar, is still bred. Um, they're beautiful birds. They follow this partial fertility pattern. The males are fertile, the females are infertile.
and they in particular have a really interesting so, uh, really interesting history. Okay, they were used, and also um, the uh, Lafayette, that's the uh, Sri Lankan jungle fowl, is the smallest of them all. That reduces the size of the chicken and gives us a lot of our bantam sized characteristics. Cool. And there's these basket bantams which have this in them and were crossed with Gallus Varius to make small sized becassars and those were used historically as kind of like a foghorn and a location beacon for the Polynesian seafaring peoples. Okay, so every canoe when they would go out in a, in a on a voyage would take one of these Becassar hybrids, always a rooster. Remember that gets to be the fertile form in birds because they're backwards for mammals, and they would pick roosters so that every canoe had a unique sounding rooster, so they could keep track of which canoe was which and where they were across the ocean without any electronics based on the sound of the rooster in his basket. Huh. Okay? That's so cool. And then they get off and they land on an island and all the chickens go free to populate that island with chickens. Well, you've got a small number of these becassars that are going running around and they will do what roosters do. Roosters do rooster things and you get more hybrids, which are ever decreasing percentage of the uh, um, Gallus Varius but again, you're carrying these traits into the new population, mm -hmm. right? And this is, we can thank, you know, like the, the Phoenix, the Arnagadori, the um, Silkies, like the Silky Bandoms, um, all of the black skin fibro chickens. We can thank this history for those genes working their way from the green jungle fowl population into the domesticated red jungle fowl population, hmm. okay? And there's a lot more complexity to it than that. I'm giving the short version, but you can see how this works, right? So we get genes from one animal population introgressing into another, which can be beneficial or deleterious, spread for or against, and contributes to the domestication complexity of these critters, okay? So from here, we're gonna start talking about examples where you have full fertility what happens right after a hybrid cross and how that can be used to our advantage. Now, hybridization is a natural process. This happens all the time. It is a normal component of adaptation and the evolution of different forms and more adaptive forms in nature. Okay. There's a really classic case study which is found in the tar weeds and silver sorts. The tar weeds, it's the, the tribe Medionae, which is a subgroup in the Asteraceae or the Aster and Sunflower family. Okay? This is a family that has so many of your common garden plants, sunflowers, asters, goldenrod, and some you don't love like ragweed. <laughs> you know, it's a really, really big plant family. Well, the tar weeds are a group of aster-like plants, which mo are most abundant west of the Rocky Mountains. About five million years ago, or at least not older than five million years ago, when the Hawaiian tall islands that we know and love today were starting to be formed, low islands formed long before that. This is like when the tall islands that we're familiar with today started to form, Kauai being the oldest one. Um, two of these tar weeds decided to get together and make some hybrid seeds. And then a silly little bird decided to take those little seeds over to the newly formed Kauai. Okay? They land there. They germinate, they propagate, they start to form a population. Now this population is what is called a hybrid swarm. We call it that because right after you've had a hybridization event, the offspring of that hybridization event start to um, really explode in terms of the number of different traits that they're expressing. When you have a huge diversity of different traits, that means that you can select in a huge diversity of different directions. And that's exactly what happened. So think about this, five million years ago, which sounds like a long time in human years, 
But in geologic time and the age of mountains and volcanoes and plate tectonics, that's yesterday. Okay? Very, very short period of time. So you have this hybrid swarm. It lands somewhere on the beach of a still forming Hawaiian island. Okay? There's very few other plants to compete with. So you have coastal areas, you have rainforest areas, you have mountain cliffs. You have all these different potential sites that it can occupy. And you have a new population which has a huge diversity of traits that it can express. So it starts doing so. The seeds spread around the island and the seeds which land in one area will start to express genes which are favorable for growth in that area. The seeds which fall up a cliff will start to express genes which are favorable for growing on that cliff. As more plants start to come in, more trees start to come in, they start to have to compete for height with the other trees in the more rainforesty regions. The genes which allow it to grow tall will start to be expressed. Okay, So in a very short period of time, this hybrid swarm evolved into a huge number of different forms. You have rosette plants, which are desert adapted. The rosette lays on the ground and it produces a gigantic uh, flower spike up above that. Okay, You have trees that look like normal forest trees. You have little low growing rosette plants. You have, there's even a vine in the group, like a forest vine all which evolved from these little tar weeds, which are just little short weeds that you would pull out of your garden or spray herbicide on, <laughs> okay? This process is called adaptive radiation. And it's possible with pure species, not just with hybrids. But when you have a hybridization event and you're starting with a hybrid swarm, it facilitates the adaptive radiation. Okay, And this is one of the things to understand when we start talking about hybrids in a farm setting is one of the key advantages to hybridization, deliberate, well thought out hybridization as a breeding strategy is that it gives you adaptability. Okay, And this is one of the ideas behind hybrid vigor, something often talked about but rarely defined. It's rarely defined because it's very hard to define, right? You'll usually see some definition like, you know, increased ability to live with hybrids over either ancestor, but that doesn't really tell you much. It doesn't always happen and it's not always useful, but the idea that a wide cross with a genetically diverse population can very quickly radiate and evolve in a whole broad array of different directions is a way of understanding the idea behind hybrid vigor. Okay? Because one of those directions is probably ideal for your setting because you've opened up your opportunities so much. This book I'm holding, Tar Weeds and Silver Swords, produced by the Missouri Botanic Garden, is currently like the definitive tome on this group of plants. If you're interested in this history, uh, go ahead and, you know, get it or get it from a library. Um, it's dense, but it's it's it has a lot of different examples and details on this evolutionary history. But for our whiteboard, let's zoom in and let's talk about some animals you'll directly interact with and some other examples of this phenomenon of hybridization, hybrid swarm, adaptive radiation. Another example of this phenomenon that's currently ongoing, the, uh, the silver swords have evolved and there, there's not a whole lot of like active movement right there right now. But here's one where there is. In North America, we have a hybrid swarm that has formed just 100 years ago and populated the East Coast and it's the Eastern Coyote. Okay, so let's talk about this one a little bit. To understand what's going on with the Eastern Coyote, we need to go back in history a little bit and understand their progenitors. So 10,000 years ago, this is the time period like just after the Pleistocene extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna ended. 
okay? That extinction is a longer period. It starts with um, genetic degradation well before the end of the Pleistocene that was further exacerbated by the glacial melt and then the Younger Dryas period was kind of like the end of things for most of those species. We still don't fully understand that event. It's an area of current study. I'm not going to say anything more than I just did, because saying anything more than I just did will start arguments with geologists, and that's off topic. So <laughs> we're leaving it there for now. Anyhow, so at, the, at that time period, you have the gray wolf and you have the coyote, OK? Now, the gray wolf undergo and the coyote both undergo a great deal of change, right? evolutionary change, right at that time period, too because the dire wolf goes extinct and that causes a reassortment of ecological niches available. But both of these creators, in general terms, predate the end of the Ice Age. Okay? They don't exist in the Ice Age in the same form they exist today, but they predate the end of the Ice Age. Now, the gray wolf, 25 to 38 kilograms, depending on which population you're looking at, and it's a circumpolar species, so you have a lot of different populations you can look look at. I just kind of picked a medium number there. Um, and the coyote, like 8 to 20 kilograms. So the gray wolf is a specialist on large ungulates, right? They're eating deer is small prey, and they're going all the way up to targeting bison and um, caribou and moose and those sorts of animals. Okay, so they're a big critter eating large prey. The coyote primarily exists west of the Mississippi River, and it is a specialist on smaller game. Okay, smaller body size, smaller game, faster, more agile. You know, it's 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 mostly all about the bunnies. Okay, where this guy is more about the deer, large and small. Now. East of the Rocky Mountains, sorry, east of the Mississippi, the coyote's direct competitor is the gray, the gray fox. Okay, where the gray fox is the bunny specialist east of the Mississippi, the coyote is the bunny specialist west of the Mississippi. Now, these guys very rarely breed, because if a gray wolf meets coyote, it kills it. Right, just flat out. Um, how these ever interbred the first time is something of a mystery probably had to do with the chaos of the Younger Dryas period and somebody with no date to ask to the prom, metaphorically speaking. But um, it happened somehow, and it produced a hybrid swarm. Right, right after this happens, we have two animals which occupy two very different ecological niches, which are genetically fertile but behaviorally separated because he always kills him. Okay. Um, having a rare hybridization event producing a hybrid swarm, which now has the genetic potential to occupy a wide range of different niches, but is not specialized on any of them. Okay? So over the course of 10,000 years, these in the, occupy the eastern region, and in the northern half of the Appalachians through New England and into the Canadian Maritimes, you have the timber wolf. Okay. The timber wolf ends up not as large as the gray wolf, but very definitively overlapping that size range. Okay. Mm -hmm. During this time period, you have to remember the northern Appalachians are occupied by woodland caribou, moose, um, even at the point of contact, moose are going down into central Pennsylvania. Um, you have uh, uh, Black Mashannon State Park in central St Pennsylvania. Black Mashannon is an old English name for moose, right? They were here. Um, you have, again, these large ungulates. You have bison in that range. You have a lot of large ungulates. So this becomes a specialist, again, on large ungulates and expresses more of the, the um, wolf genes than the coyote genes as it evolves into this niche. And it also still has the um, the gray the gray fox for a competition for the smaller game. Okay, the red wolf occupies the southern Appalachians down into Texas. It is larger than the coyote, but it averages the 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 absolute min max definitely overlap. 
but the red wolf averages smaller than the timber wolf does because it doesn't have as much diversity of large ungulates to prey on. Mm. Okay, so the red wolf is a little smaller than the timber wolf. The timber wolf is a little smaller than the gray wolf. These are both smaller than the gray wolf because they're carrying some of the coyote genetic load. But in the north where you have larger prey, you have a larger body size. In the south where you have smaller prey on average, you average a smaller body size. Though they definitely overlap. Mm -hmm. Okay? And those kind of settled out were stabilized until contact when this guy was exterminated from um, New England and the Mid-Atlantic. They still persisted in um, southeastern Canada with the center of their population being in Algonquin State Park. That's going to get very important here in a minute. And the red wolf was almost exterminated, but it held on in a couple of isolated areas. So it's not extinct. There are still red wolves you can go see in zoos. They're being reintroduced in um, the Piedmont region. But, uh, you know, it, it kind of was Southern Appalachian Piedmont specialists. So we're working with it. We're bringing it back. Um, it's not going to go anywhere it, it survived, right? Same with the timber wolf, but ha that has stayed more northernly, okay? Now, about a hundred years ago, the pure coyote started to migrate in response to the predator vacuum, right? The, uh, uh, you know, the timber wolf was exterminated locally, the uh, mountain lion was exterminated locally, the uh, uh, Wolverine exterminated from many areas. So, you know, you overall have a predator vacuum. The coyote starts to come up and fill that vacuum. Now, gray wolves will instantly kill any coyote they, say, they, they see. You can't say the same of the timber wolf. The timber wolf will freely breed with the coyote. Mm -hmm. So once the coyote migrating north of the Great Lakes reached Algonquin uh, Park, they immediately started to breed with the timber wolf. Okay? You can still see this. There's a whole pile of conspiracy theories out there about various governmental agencies deliberately making coyote timber wolf hybrids. They're bupkis because you can see it happening in nature in Algonquin Park today. It's an ongoing process that has been observed and is continually observed. It's real. Just accept that. Moving on. Um... So now you have a coyote timber wolf hybrid and it starts to migrate south out of Algonquin Park into regions that are unoccupied by any compatible canine other than domestic dogs. Hmm. So the coyote timber wolf hybrid now further hybridizes with dogs at the periphery of the expanding range. This is why the um, eastern coyote is commonly has an Irish setter red color phase, which the traditional wolves do not. That's dog DNA. So now we have majority coyote followed by, in terms of percentage of genetics across the whole population, we have majority coyote followed by substantial, you know, even 10-20% timber wolf genes followed by a not irrelevant 5 to 10 percent dog genes. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is a hybrid swarm. This then fills the East very, very rapidly. Okay, remember, hybrid swarm, not yet specialized, but with a tremendous amount of genetic potential. And in the last, you know, 50, 60 years, since they have fully populated the East Coast, they are evolving into more than one new species. So every time they do a study on the genetics of eastern coyotes, if that study is done in the mountain regions, the central spine of the Appalachian Range, where deer are the primary prey, they're getting more and more of a percentage of timber wolf genes. It's going up. If you look down in, in more of the Piedmont regions, the coastal plains where deer are less abundant and the, um, like the, pine, the, the, the pine barrens and those sorts of areas, it's not great habitat for large ungulates. Um, the bison were never in there. The moose were never in there, right? It's just not good. It's just not the right habitat for that, but it's really great bunny rabbit territory. So 
they're specializing more in competing with foxes for the rabbit population, they're expressing more and more of the coyote genes. Mm -hmm. And the wolf percentage is diminishing. So in the Appalachians, they're evolving more into a new species of wolf. In the Piedmont, they're evolving more into a new species of coyote. And then in urban areas, the percentage of dog is increasing rapidly. Hmm. So the domestic dog genes, reduced expression of testosterone, better ability to tolerate people and specialize on a specialize in a habitat that has a dense human population, you're increasing the percentage of the dog DNA. So you're turning into a third species, which is neither coyote nor wolf, but is gradually losing its fear of humanity because of the dog genes. Hmm. Of the three, that's the most potentially dangerous. Mm -hmm. So this is the same thing that happened historically with the Silver Sword Alliance in Hawaii is happening currently with this gray wolf coyote population. Mm -hmm. Okay, And it's an ongoing process. And we can watch in real time all parts of it happening. Right? If you go up and you look at the studies of um, coyote and wolf populations in Algonquin National Park, there are pure coyote, there are pure wolf, and there are hybrids every year. Right? So every year, new hybridization events are occurring right now, today, documented, true facts. <laughs> okay? So it's an ongoing process and we're developing a new species. So that's, that's really interesting. Now, let's look at some things that are more directly domesticated. This is still happening in the wilds, right? But this happens in domestication too. So the domestic apples are a really great example of a hybrid swarm. Um, I've talked about these in some earlier videos, and at some point I'm going to do a big expose just on what apples actually are botanically. So I'm not going to go into all of the depth now, but the largest apple in terms of wild species is Malassiversi from the border of Kazakhstan and China. As that apple was transported worldwide across the Silk Road and then by sailing ships, it has had the opportunity to interbreed with literally every crab apple out there. And what we have today, apples express so many different traits from like sickeningly sweet to tannic to teeny tiny fruit grown as ornamentals, right? To white flowers, to red flowers, you know, uh, white, red, yellow fruits. All of these different traits are coming from different wild progenitors. It's a hybrid swarm. The domestic apple as we currently know it is a hybrid swarm, okay? And it's being selected in all of those different directions because humans appreciate that diversity in their landscapes and orchards because it allows more utility in the fruit. Okay, chickens are a are a hybrid swarm. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Corn, corn is a hybrid. Corn does not exist in nature. Its primary progenitor is um, the Teosinte tea plant but it's been hybridized with other grasses to produce what we now know as domestic corn. So corn is a hybrid swarm. And again, look at all of the different types of corn, so from little teeny tiny cobbed ornamentals up to, you know, Lancaster sure crop and all of its uh, domestic variations, commercial variations thereof. So corn is a good example of a hybrid swarm. And then, um, you know, domestic animals, Iron Age hog. Okay, it's a hybrid of wild boar and uh, British hog varieties. Okay, and it has the size and wildness of the wild boar, but um, it also has a lot of domestic traits in there as well, further increasing its size. And it's it's an interesting story. It was produced in order to supply like the exotic meat market for a wild boar type meat, but it was grown in Canada because it's more cold hardy than any other pig variety. They escaped in Canada and now there is a huge thriving 
rapidly expanding, and I mean rapidly, um, population of these uh, Iron Age hogs that are now hardy in central Canada, like in the, the deep snow, deep cold central Canada. Whereas the wild boar that went wild as, as escapees of Spanish hogs were never able to tolerate that cold habitat. So the Iron Age hog, being a hybrid swarm, more genes to express, more adaptable, is now evolving into a new species of wild hog, which is Arctic adapted. Hmm. Okay? So that's not such a good thing, <laughs> right? But it is a thing that's happening. And it shows the adaptability of hybridization. So as we're thinking through this, when would you want to use hybridization as a breeding technique? The answer is when you want, one of the answers is when you want adaptability. Mm -hmm. And you, or when you want the ability to take an existing species in a new direction. Okay, let's talk about some others. Now, the second reason to do this on a homestead is genetic rescue, right? We talked about how hybridization can lead to increased adaptability to changing environments or different environments. So it should already stand to reason that this could be used to rescue weak lines, okay? And indeed it can. So genetic rescue is the concept where you're taking a line that has become very, very weak or is almost extinct. You're going to hybridize it with a distant line to regenerate adaptability, regenerate heterozygosity. Remember when we were talking about line breeding in the previous video in this series, that reduced heterozygosity is in and of itself a problem. Okay, Even if you're not fixing bad alleles into your population, even if you're eliminating bad alleles from the population, Heterozygosity, sorry, homozygosity, when excessive, is its own problem in and of itself. So when that occurs, hybridization or, or outcrossing is a way to reverse that process. Okay? So this is what we're talking about here with genetic rescue. And you know, the basic concept is very, very simple you're going to take the line that you want that has the characteristics that you want you're going to hybridize it with another line or another population or another species depending on how and depending on what situation you're in and you're going to regenerate that adaptive potential regenerate the the vigorous characteristics of the line and then you're going to back cross so you're going to take your hybrids and cross them back to the original species or the original line, much like the beefalo project, right? You're, that's an outcross, backcross scheme. It's a very complex one, more complex than most, but that is an example of an outcross, backcross scheme. And you're going to reselect for the original phenotype of the line or population that you like while attempting to retain the increased vigor of the hybrid cross. Problems come in when people get too attached to that Victorian notion of purebred and they back cross too far. If you do too much back crossing, all you do is you regenerate the original problem. Okay? I don't do a lot of credential flaunting on this channel and I'm not going to, but I'm about to critique some big name projects. So I do want to tell you that I have a master's in botany and a PhD in medical biochemistry. I am qualified to make the critiques I'm about to make. Okay? And I'm about to critique the American Chestnut Society. <laughs> okay? They are working on genetic rescue with the American Chestnut, a species, if you're not familiar with it, American chestnut used to be one of the dominant tree species in eastern North America. It has extremely valuable nuts, extremely valuable timber, and it was a key component of the ecosystem. When it went out, it was decades and decades before wildlife populations reassorted and restabilized. It was that important. 
the uh, Chinese chestnut is resistant to the chestnut blight and it produces faster and it produces larger nuts than the American chestnut. So a bunch of folks that were trying to develop a chestnut industry in North America decided, oh, we want to grow the better Chinese chestnut. The problem is it's a shorter tree, it's not very good for timber, and it does not tolerate the wet, humid climate of eastern North America very well because it's a desert tree. So in trying to get something better, they got something worse. <laughs> And in doing so, they imported the chestnut blight, which wiped out the native chestnut, which actually is better in the forest setting. So, the, uh, there's a, a couple of populations of American chestnuts that are disconnected from the East Coast population that have survived, so we still have the species, but it is ecologically extinct in Eastern North America. It also does persist as stump sprouts, so the blight kills the stem but not the roots. So as long as you know you have an environment where the stump is not excessively shaded, those roots will keep regenerating. So it persists along trails, along road edges, at the edges of meadows. There's a lots of locations where those stumps are, even though they died, even though they died a hundred years ago, those stumps are still sending up sprouts they'll survive for 10, 15 years, and then the sprout dies, and then the stump sends up another sprout. So we still have genetic material to work with, okay? Um, there have been two projects. One is people who just said, okay, I just want a chestnut which will survive in my climate. And they have produced hybrids that are, you know, on the order of a quarter to half Chinese chestnut and American chestnut, okay? A common example is the Dunstan chestnut. That's the most available in commerce. There are several dozen different hybrids that you can go and buy, and you can buy right now. And they're all majority Chinese chestnut. They have a tree form, which is more like the Chinese than like the American, but they have the, enough American in there to tolerate our local soils right here in the east. And the Dunstan is the most famous and the easiest to find if you start Googling around and trying to find one of these. But it's one of about a dozen. I'm not saying it's better than any of the other dozen. It's, the, it's more familiar than the rest of the dozen. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. The American Chestnut Society has a good idea. They said, okay, if we can breed this and we can get that resistance, let's back cross until we are 15 sixteenths American chestnut, at which point it will be pure enough and we can reintroduce it into the environment. Okay, notice my air quotes. Started out really good, just like the Dunstans, they started out when it's 50-50, great. They can select for the, um, the hardy individuals. They then take the hardy individuals, cross them with each other, select for the hardy individuals again, and then do another back cross to the American. It's a very good plan. The problem is that the Chinese chestnut's resistance comes in two forms. First, there's three key genes. You must have those three key genes. So you're dealing with a tri-hybrid cross. That means you need to breed a large population in order to find a small number of fixed um, of, of true homozygous individuals, homozygous for those three genes, those three key genes, okay? And it's a tree. It takes 20 years to produce fruit from seed minimum. So it's a very long generation time. So you need both a large number of individuals and it's a long generation time. Now, the American Chestnut Society has done some wonderful, amazing work in shortening that generation time and figuring ways to force them to produce seed earlier so they can accelerate the progress. And they have gotten out to three quarters American, showing the growth characteristics of the American, showing the fruit characteristics of the American, but still, you know, and, and still retaining the disease resistance of the Chinese. The problem comes in when they insist on the 15 16 
because those three genes aren't just existing on their own in a data set or in a petri dish they're existing in a whole system they have to interact with the rest of the system that is the chinese chestnut so when they push to 15 16 every time they do it their resistance collapses and they regenerate the original problem mm -hmm. okay I love the American Chestnut Association, don't get me wrong. I love what they're doing, don't get me wrong, but they're pushing it too far. Okay? Um, it just doesn't work. You can't just take those three genes, put them in a functionally American Chestnut frame, and expect it to still be resistant. It just isn't working. And the joke is that they're five years from having their finished product and always will be. Okay? That's what it's been. If they would just release the three quarters, we'd have it already and we'd be repopulating our hillsides with Amer with the, the ecological equivalent of the American chestnut. But because of that Europe, that, that, that um, Victorian European idea of 15 sixteenths is pure, they're insisting on the 15 sixteenths. And I think that's foolish. Right? Because in the meantime, people like me who just want a chestnut, we're planting the Dunstan. So by the time they get around to producing their 15 16 pure tree, which they may eventually get, <coughs> it's going to be inundated with all of these Dunstans that are already planted. It's going to hybridize back with these Dunstans that are already planted. And in certain locations, even with pure Chinese that have already been planted, I've planted both on my farm. I've planted two Dunstans and I've planted about 50 pure Chinese on a really dry site. Okay? So, when the American Chestnut Society releases theirs, I'm going to plant them too in other sites, which aren't good for the Dunstan or the pure Chinese. But the pollen is going to be immediately crossing with my Dunstan and pure Chinese. And the overall population is going to end up back to half or three quarters. So it's a self-defeating philosophy that something must be 15 sixteenths to be pure. So we need to do genetic rescue. We need to save the species. We need to support the American Chestnut Society. But we need to know when to stop. And when you're doing your own genetic rescue programs, you need to know when to stop. Don't try to push it more than three quarters the original. And then once you have your, your um, F2 or F3 generations that's like on the order of five eighths to three quarters, your original line, use the breeding techniques discussed in the last video to select for your key phenotypic traits but leave it three quarters that is my advice when you're doing genetic rescue okay especially if you don't have a major scientific society behind you mm -hmm. right um i do suspect eventually the american chestnut society is going to get what they want but as a practical reality they're going to lose it as soon as they outplant it next to all of these mm -hmm. right they will eventually get what they want because they have major backing. They have huge backing to do this project. You as a farmer don't have that backing. You just need to get something that works and looks the way you want it to look. Stop at five eighths or three quarters. Okay? Stop somewhere in that range. And then select for the phenotype. Now, this absolutely applies to domestic animals. So I'll give you a couple examples. The point to donkey the Totenlager chicken are two breeds that almost went extinct. Okay? The point to donkey was down to 44 individuals worldwide at its lowest, and now it's been bred up to a few hundred. Okay? The Totenlager chicken was similar. I, I, I don't know what it was down to, but it was a very, very low number on the same order as the Totenlager. And it now has some breed societies which are promoting it in Europe and it's been imported to the Americas. Okay, which is good because now there's two populations in different areas that people are working with. Okay, and some very bright people are working with these. Um, but if you notice this, think back to the 5500 rule. Once a breed is dropped below the 5500 rule or a specialty line within a breed is dropped below the 5500 rule, 
you need to think about genetic rescue and outcrossing. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, the Onigadori in North America is an example. This is the non-molting Japanese long tail breed. In Japan, it's okay. But because it's been regarded and designated as a Japanese national treasure, there have only been a very, very small number of exports of that breed to Europe and America. And they uh, um, very quickly lost viability because their populations were so small. So it's a specialty line within a breed. Now, those populations needed immediate genetic rescue, and that genetic rescue resulted in the production of a second breed, the Phoenix. And the Phoenix chicken is a very strong breed. I'm working with them in some of my breeding projects. Mm -hmm. So it's not true Onagadori, but it contains the key traits of the Onagadori, and some lines are even non-molting. Okay? Um... So down in the southeast, there's uh, uh, three or four really dedicated breeders that have been working with the Phoenix to find those non-molting genes and concentrate them and recreate kind of an American on a Godori type chicken, and they're doing it successfully. So that's an example of successful genetic rescue, okay? The Totenlager is ongoing genetic rescue. Um, they're now commercially available, thank goodness, and a lot of very bright poultry breeders are working with them, and the breed's going to be okay in the long run. Okay, As long as people are mindful of the don't go more than three-quarter Totenlager, <laughs> right? You get your pure Totenlagers, you outcross them, you backcross them once, and you work with it. Stop there. Um, so, you know, they're going to be totally fine. Point two donkey is in serious, serious danger. Not only were there only 44 worldwide, but the populations were separated half in North America and half in um, the Mediterranean region. Okay, It's a very large donkey. It's very distinctive. It was used for breeding draft mules. And um, it's got really, really long hair that forms dreadlocks. Okay, So it's a very, very unique critter. They're, I think they're adorable, um, but because the population is split and import-export regulations prevent those two populations from being traded, mm -hmm. okay, basically each side only has about 20. And that's actual population, not effective population. The effective population is even lower than that. So they're not even close to the 5500 rule. There is a breed association that is working with them, but they're dictating it's a closed herd book to maintain this Victorian idea of purity. They will kill the breed if they don't do genetic rescue. Mm -hmm. Yes, they've bred them up to 500 individuals, but their affected population is still in the single digits. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're listening from that breed association, please do some genetic rescue. You will destroy the breed if you don't, guaranteed. The population has dropped so low it cannot be saved without outcrossing. Mm -hmm. Okay, it needs to be intelligent outcrossing. Needs to be done well. Needs to be back crossed intelligently, and the breed is savable. But until that starts to happen this breed is simply on borrowed time and it will go extinct if it is not rescued. Okay? And then again, even within breeds that are safe, there could be individual lines that have suffered excessive inbreeding or unintelligent line breeding and have become weak. Those breeds then need, those lines then need genetic rescue. But in that case, Remember, any cross which increases net heterozygosity is a hybrid cross. So when you're talking about a breed that is weakened, like a line within a breed that is weakened because it has suffered excessive inbreeding as becoming too homozygous for its own good, the hybrid cross can come in the form of crossing it with another line of the same breed, assuming the breed as a whole still retains sufficient heterozygosity. That's still a hybrid cross. Okay? But it's much closer hybrid cross and then does not require back crossing to regenerate the phenotype. You can just do your hybrid cross, 
take the F1's selective breed within that population. Get the characteristics that you want. You will rebuild some of your heritability to make further progress and all is well. Okay? So those are some examples of this happening in both a wild population and some domestic populations. Now, genetic rescue is different from something called breeding back. And this is, uh, breeding back is an idea that started around World War II and it started with cattle. So the aurochs, which are the European wild cattle, went extinct a few hundred years ago. I'm not sure the exact calendar of that, but they went extinct a few hundred years ago. They, they went extinct in the wild long before that, but some were saved in hunting parks, and then the British nobility hunted them to extinction in their hunting parks. Go you. Anyway, so around World War II, people decided to um, work on breeding back the Iraq because they said, okay, yes, the wild Iraq is extinct, but if we go down and we, we tally all of the characteristics that were observed and des described by historic writers, all of those characteristics still exist in domestic cattle. So if we select the right breeds, make the right crosses within those breeds, and then select using the historic descriptions of a rock as a guide and basically a standard of excellence, you know, as a guide, we could bring back a pseudo a rock. Okay? That is um, what breeding back entails. There are also breeding back programs that are trying to like re recreate extinct breeds of, of livestock where they were either composite breeds or they have descendants. Like there's the original breed doesn't exist, but descendants do. Um, then, you know, people want the original breed back. They'll take their descendants and go reselect for the characteristics ascribed to the original breed. So breeding brack projects are different from genetic rescue. We're not going to go into detail on that here in this video, but I did want to mention it. Okay. So we have um, create extended adaptability. We have talked about genetic rescue of weak lines. And we're all going to hope that the point to association gets their head out of their donkey. And we will proceed with the next application for um, uh, hybridization, which is the uh, introduction of new traits that you want to work with that you don't have available in an existing line. As mentioned, hybridization can be used to create or modify existing breeds. So I wanted to give a specific example here of how to think about this and thought that I'd use the example of one of my own breeding projects. Just for a little background on this, when I think about an ideal breed for a homestead setting, it's not the same as an ideal breed for a production setting. Homesteading is more about the family economy, not so much about making a cash crop to sell. When you're making a cash crop to sell, you want to pick livestock that does one thing extremely well so that you can make money at that thing, right? When you're thinking about a homestead breed, you're thinking about, ha about minimizing investment and getting the maximum number of products out of it, but you only need those products in scale with what the home can use, right? So I'm not thinking about a chicken breed that's going to give me enough eggs to sell or give me enough meat to sell or give me enough feathers to sell. I'm thinking about a chicken breed that can give me enough meat for me and my family and enough eggs for me and my family and enough feathers for me and my family. And I do believe that a good homestead breed, when conceived of that way, should produce at least three things. Okay? And at least one of those things should be produced without requiring the slaughter of the animal. Okay? For chickens, that's obviously eggs. Um, for my sheep, that's wool and potentially milk. We don't milk our sheep right now, but it is a milkable breed. Right? So all animals give meat. I want two other products, and I want one of those to be gifted without having to kill all of the animals. Okay? That's how I'm thinking about a homestead breed. 
Now, some people will say, but, 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 you can't say that because multi-purpose breeds don't produce enough of any one thing to make money at. It's like, yes, that's the point. I'm not trying to make money at it. I'm trying to have enough eggs for me, <laughs> you know? So it's a different way of thinking about this, right? Um, yes, if you want to have enough eggs to sell, go get your leghorns and do your egg thing, right? You need to specialize. But this is about, specifically, about broadening, not about specializing. Just to clarify that. Um, goal setting is important. And when you're thinking about what you want, do write your goals out. Do think about them in a very clear way. So I've done that here. I've written out what I want of my chickens. And this is, it's not literal order of importance, but the things toward the top of the list are more important than the things toward the bottom of the list. Okay? So you kind of think of like the top half of the list being more important than the bottom half of the list. So first and foremost, thrifty. That's sort of a generic catch-all term for an animal that lives well, survives well, and does well on moderate food intake, okay? So an animal that tries to die is not thrifty, and an animal that has to be force-fed the most expensive food in the world in order to just maintain itself is also not thrifty, okay? So I want thrifty animals. I want calm animals, okay? I do eat some of my chickens and they vote themselves into the stew pot by not being calm. Okay? Um, I want good foragers. Again, that kind of relates to thriftiness. I want good mothers. Okay? Our, our little farm is off grid, so I need the, my chickens to be good mothers and raise their own young without me having to intervene with hatching, you know, eggs and incubators and brooding. Okay? Artificial brooding. I need good mothers. I need predator resistance. And I put ish next to this. I want them to be predator resistant ish. It's still a chicken. Everything still thinks it's delicious, including every fox, coyote, raccoon in the, in the neighborhood. Um, you know, and no chicken is ever going to stand up to an attack by a grizzly bear. I get that. But at the same time, I don't want it to just sit there and say, okay, you can eat me now. Right? I at least want it to try and get away. <laughs> okay? Um, and then along with that, I want it to fly well and I want it to run well. Okay, both of those. I want it to be large-ish. I'm not looking for a super-sized large market carcass, right, like a Jersey Giant. That's not what I mean by large. But at the same time, I want it to be more than a bantam, more than just a skinny, lanky, you know, game bird-sized animal, because I do want some meat when I do harvest them. So I want it to be large-ish, but average large-ish is fine. It doesn't have to be gigantic. I want it to lay reasonably well. Okay, again, I'm not looking to compete for the egg market with leghorns. I want, I just, but I do want it to be lit, to lay well enough that it keeps my immediate family and eggs throughout the year. Okay. Um, now these last couple, I tie flies. There's a few fly tying videos on the channel, so I'm thinking about that. Right, so I have meat for a product, I have eggs for a product, and I want feathers for a product. So to tie, to tie flies, to have you know, especially dry flies, you want the hard feather gene, which is a single Mendelian trait, and it controls whether or not the, the, the webbing goes all the way to the edges of the feather. If the webbing is contained just to the middle and only to the lower half of the feather, it's hard feathered. If the, the webbing goes all the way to the edges into the tip of the feather, then it's soft feathered, okay? So this doesn't mean, having the hard feather gene doesn't mean that the feather is literally hard and stiff in texture. It just means that it's not webbed its entire length, okay? So I need the hard feather gene, and I do want it to be as stiff in texture as possible. This is polygenetic, okay? That's not a single Mendelian trait. That's a polygenetic trait. So that's selection over a long period of time. And I want the, the length. I want long feathers. Okay? Now, there's no chicken that meets all of those criteria. Trust me. I looked. <laughs> okay? So, I need to combine a couple of things. Right? So, the two breeds that I'm working with most most closely are the Orloff and the Phoenix, okay? Um, the Orloff is often called the, Ru the, the Russian Orloff, which is very logical considering that the breed originates from Iran. And go figure, right? 
<laughs> we name things. And, and, and it, it originates from Iran and was refined in its modern form in Germany. So it's called the Russian Orlov. It's just that's the promoter of it. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that's nonsensical. I'm just calling it the Orlov. And uh, the Phoenix. Okay, so let's look at which boxes these tick. Orlov is thrifty and calm. They're garbage foragers. They're garbage mothers. They just sit there and say, please eat me now if a predator comes along. They don't fly well at all. They run reasonably well. They have nice long legs. Um, they're very large. They lay well through the winter, which is good. They're, they're known for winter layers. Um, they do have the hard feather gene. Their feathers are sort of stiff-ish. They're not real limp. They're not super stiff either. Um, they're short feathered, right? So this ticks a little more than half of the boxes, okay? Then the phoenix. They're thrifty and some lines are calm, some lines are not. Remember in the previous board I mentioned that the phoenix is a modern rescued version of the uh, Onagadori. The Onagadori is extraordinarily calm, so some lines of phoenix still express that. Other lines as part of the rescue were crossed with game foul, and those are not mm. calm. Okay? So it depends on which line you're working with, whether or not they're calm. So I, I kind of wrote calm-ish, <laughs> right? It, it depends. Um, they're extraordinarily good foragers. They are extraordinarily good mothers. They're extraordinarily predator resistant for a chicken, although I did just lose my favorite rooster to a uh, raccoon attack recently. So again, you know, predator resistant-ish, we're not talking about predator proof. No chicken is predator proof. They fly extremely well. They don't run for beans. They're small. They don't lay well. They're seasonal layers. They're good layers for three months of the year and then they quit. Yeah, okay. Right, so they're seasonal layers. Um, the Orloff is, lays all, all through the year. They're, they're seasonal. Um, they do have the hard feather gene. Their feathers are stiff-ish. The lines that were crossed with game fowl are stiffer than the lines that are calm. Um, and they're long feathered. That's the whole point of why they were bred. So again, ticks a little bit more than half the boxes. But neither breed ticks all the boxes. So you hybridize them. Mm -hmm. Okay? When we hybridize them, we'll create a hybrid swarm, and then from that hybrid swarm, select. Okay? And how I manage my chicken population is a combination of mob breeding with me choosing specific pairs to mate, and I do both. And then when the mom goes broody, I'll go and grab a couple extra eggs out of the mob bred core and put them with the, the broody head. So I'm always doing both. Choosing individual pairs to make selections means that I am going to make progress toward these breeding goals. The mob breeding component um, ensures that I give the, the optimum opportunity for spontaneous ad adaptation, spontaneous interesting things to occur, and prevent me from getting tunnel vision and ending up with an inbred line. Hmm. So I'm using a combination of both of those. Mm -hmm. Now along the way, there's a couple genes I want to bring in from outside. One is Long, longer legs than either of these two have. The melee is what I want to use for that. So I'm asking around locally and looking for somebody who has a couple of melees that I could buy a couple of hens. The, the males of the melee can be a little on the gretzy side, so I don't want to deal with any males. Uh, they're not as bad as these, right? But they can be a little on the gretzy side. Um, but anyway, more than I want to deal with. So I just want a couple of females to breed once and then I'm done with it. Right, so I'll introduce those genes kind of once into the mob and then let the, you know, some artificial and some natural selection take over and decide what to do with those genes. And then um, I also want stiffer feathers without losing any more leg length than I'm already losing to the phoenix. And that's a seal, shamu, and cornish, especially these first two. Right, so I just this summer was able to buy a couple of 50-50 a seal phoenix hens that are going into my breeding project. And those hens are going to be crossed with an Orloff rooster. 
So I will have one third Phoenix, one third a seal, and half Orloff, and that will then go into the mob. So, you know, these guys are notoriously pugnacious. I don't want to emphasize that. Remember, I want calm birds. So I'm introducing these genes in a very diluted form and in small numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's my project. Now I have some F1s that you'll see in this video clip. Here's a couple others. F1. Right there is one of my pure Orloff roosters. Another F1 right there. Real nice feathering. There you can see both of them in a nice uh, close-up, the P1 and F1. Again, we're just going to be keeping them more in the 50-50 kind of condition, selecting for Orloff type and Phoenix feathering. She's going to be hard to see, but here's one of our hens, F1 hens, sitting on eggs in one of the little coops that we use for pair matings. Um, they are extraordinarily good mothers. I haven't worked with them long enough to know how they do on overall egg production, but we could always increase the Orloff percentage or bring in something else like a Chanticleer that's fairly similar genetically, but r no, well known for egg production. Um, success will be the measure of success, not any kind of predetermined blood, qu blood quantum. That's just dumb. Success is your measure of success. Now, the terminus of this little talk is going to be the terminal hybrid cross. And a terminal hybrid cross is any hybrid cross where you have no intent of going past the F1 generation. Okay? There could be a couple different reasons for this. First, let's just go to the classic horse donkey equals mule. Mules are completely infertile. There is no option to go beyond an F1 hybrid, right? <laughs> obvious things are obvious. If mules were fertile, would we have a self-perpetuating breed of mules? Yeah, probably. But they aren't, so we don't. End of story. <laughs> now, what we do have are multiple breeds of horse and donkey that were bred specifically for making draft mules. Hmm. Okay? So usually with horses, it would be one of the draft breeds, right? Percheron, Belgian, um, you know, American draft, cream draft horse, like those sorts of breeds would be the horse component. And then the two real specialty donkey breeds that were used for making large body draft mules are the American Mammoth Jackstock, as the size, as the name implies, they were just a very, very big donkey and the point two, which we already talked about a little bit, and we are really hoping get saved properly because they're very important to the agricultural history of Europe and North America. And both breeds were very common in North America a long time ago, but are both endangered now, which is sad. We need to save them. Um, but yeah, that, you, you breed the donkey and the horse to cross well, and, but you have to do your breeding and selection at the donkey and horse stage. You can't do it at the mule stage because they know can, mm -hmm. okay? Second example, and this is a common one, the Cornish Rock Broiler Chicken. These one, the commercial broilers that grow super duper fast. These are two chickens crossed, so the offspring are fertile. But what we're doing is we're taking the Cornish chicken, much like with the mules, you would breed the horse and the donkey to both be good draft animals in their own right, and then get the mules out of them. Similar idea here, but we're going to breed them in different directions. So the Cornish comes from the Cornish game hen, okay, and they are bred simply for size. They are line bred specifically to be as big as possible. Okay, And then you have the rock, like the, the barred rock, but there's other rock chickens, right? Barred rock is the most, most famous. Um, they're using the white rock because they want white offspring. Okay, So they'll take a, a white rock and they line breed them exclusively for fast growth. Okay, So here they only care about size, here they only care about growth. And then when they cross them, you get the Cornish rock crosses. 
right? It's not just any Cornish and any rock. It's a specific line of big Cornish and a specific line of fast growing white rock. Okay? You get the Cornish rock cross. This stops at F1 because of poor survival to reproductive rate, H. They grow so fast, they end up with metabolic problems going down on their haunches. They're not thrifty into and through adulthood. They're very thrifty when they're growing as young chicks, but once you get out past a month and a half or so, they start to lose thriftiness, go down in vigor. Their fast growth has overwhelmed their ability to digest and process nutrition, and they just lose all of their good qualities. So saving them to breed for more of this line is counterproductive. It's also counterproductive because they're hybrids, they won't breed true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you want to make your own Cornish rock crosses, you absolutely can, but not by breeding Cornish rock crosses. You need to get Cornish and you need to get rock. You need to invest the time in developing a big line here and a fast line there. And after 10 years of this, then you can make your Cornish rock crosses. And you have to maintain these in separate in isolation from each other, separate coop, separate facil facilities. So that's how, you know, that's where the commercial Cornish rock crosses come from. Also, this idea is the idea behind almost all of your like hybrid vegetables, right? Hybrid corn, hybrid tomatoes, hybrid peppers. They're doing this game. They're saying in this corn or this pepper or this tomato, we want to focus on these two traits being dominant. So we'll take one line of tomatoes and breed it for this trait. Another line of tomatoes, breed it for that trait cross those two lines and then immediately sell the seed hmm. okay that's why you know you get those traits because you're it's complementary dominant traits it only works if the traits you're breeding for are both dominant okay but when you have complementary dominant traits and they're homozygous for, for the trait for which they were bred okay when you cross them all of those dominant traits are expressed in the offspring but then in the F2 generation, they reassort and they don't look like their parents. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's how those work. And doing this with corn or tomatoes or peppers or chickens or anything, it's all the same concept. Obviously, there's differences in how you manage a chicken breeding program from a corn breeding program. But at the level of the genetics involved, they're conceptually the same. Okay? And then the third example I want to talk about here is the British three-tier sheep breeding program. And this is breeding sheep for production lamb and mutton. Okay? And it's almost less about the sheep and more about the terrain. This is really mostly an adaptation to terrain. So in this is really mostly done in the north of England. Okay, north of England and Scotland and Wales. Is, is where you find this. So in those regions you have tall hills which you know they're not like Himalaya high but because of how far north they are and how they interact with sea breezes and everything they're very very harsh terrain. Okay. So the harsh terrain farms, the, the, the hill farms, they have to raise a very thrifty hardy breed. Okay. So you have the hill breeds, right? The um, blackface hill breeds are one, like the blackface Scottish sheep is a famous one. Um, the uh, um, uh, black uh, the black Welsh sheep is a is a hill breed, right? So you have those really tough hill breeds. They're very good at maintaining themselves on lousy pasture. They're very good at bearing young on lousy pasture, but they grow slowly in response to having a lower food, lower nutrient availability, and they don't have many kids, right? They don't have many lambs. So I guess kid is a bad word association in this context. Anyway, moving on. They don't have many lambs. <laughs> they don't have many babies, okay? <laughs> so they're low on productivity, but they're very good at maintaining themselves in that habitat. Now, there's another group, the, the British long wool breeds. They're from the south of England. They're very large. They're very good mothers. 
they're very milky. They produce a huge amount of milk. And they have a lot of babies. Okay? So they have increased fecundity. But they can't make it just out on the pasture in a hill farm. So to increase the fecundity and body size and milkiness of the hill breeds, what they do is the hill farmers will raise a, a flock of female hill breeds. Okay? Now, obviously, to maintain a flock of females, you need a few males of the same variety, right? But that's just to keep that farm going, not for export. Okay? So they'll maintain a flock of female of whichever hill breed is most appropriate for their area, and then they'll cross to one of the long wolves, right? These are like Teeswater, Wesleydale, um, Lester Long Wool, Lincoln Long Wool, those breeds, okay? So now they can have their large flock and their majority of their investment in the females which are adapted to the top of their hill, and they could just keep one or two or three males of the low country um, long wool in a barn somewhere. Right, but now you're only keeping a very small number of sheep in the barn with the higher husbandry demands. Mm -hmm. The majority of your flock is out on the hill. Okay? So then they'll breed these males that they're keeping in the barn with the females that are out on the hill. They'll get their babies. The babies are now called a highland mule. Now, this is not mule in the sense that this is a mule. The mule sheep are fully fertile, right? They're, they're all the same species. And with sheep, even all of the species of sheep are interfertile. Um, you know, there's uh, genetics from a North American bighorn sheep in East Asian domestic sheep, right? <laughs> and that was before contact. You know, all of these genes are mixed mentioned that in earlier videos, but you know, reiterate that. So these are fully fertile. Now the Highland mule offspring, the males are typically going to market. The females are going to tier two, which is an upland farm. Still relatively harsh climate compared to what these guys are used to, but a lot easier and richer pasture than the hill farm. So this is an intermediate condition. They will bear more young, more milk and have a larger carcass size, okay? And the these intermediate sheep are fully climate adapted to this intermediate ground, okay? So tier two is going to purchase females from tier one and they're gonna go down to the lowlands and purchase a male again of an even less hardier but bigger muscled breed. Right, so Texel and South Down and those sorts of critters that are just really like chonk. Arnold Schwarzenegger looking chonk sheep, you know, with what we would call an extreme market carcass. They're not hardy enough, right? The long wool and the Texel, they're not hardy enough to thrive in the upland farm. But again, the upland farm only needs to buy a small number of males because this is a terminal program. It's not going past this one cross. They don't need to even worry about genetic diversity of their males. They just need enough to do their job with however many females they have. Okay? Um, so they'll buy enough rams to service all of their females, keep them in a barn with higher levels of husbandry, but they're not investing a lot because it's small numbers. And then these offspring will be raised to weaning and then sold to the lowland farm with their rich pasture for final finishing and fattening. Okay? So each is a, it, it's kind of a, a, a three-step terminal cross, but you're not taking the mules to breed more mules, and you're not taking the mule texel crosses to breed more mule texel crosses, right? So each step is a terminal step, even though it's a little bit more complicated. And it's a response to um, the countryside and market demands. Okay, uh, before modern transportation allowed the easy move of livestock that we have, you know, you know, you were just growing hill sheep in the hill farms. They were just inherently less prosperous. But that was okay because everybody around was inherently less prosperous, so it was lower cost of living. You know, but now when you're comparing this. You know, when, when this can be down here in an hour, right, it homogenizes cost of living, 
puts more demands on the productive system, but at the same time opens up the possibility of easy transport for the livestock. And this is this system is an adaptation to that. Okay, it hasn't been implemented anywhere else in the world, just because it's not needed anywhere else in the world. You know, if you're a low country farm, and there's nothing around you but low country farms, just raise the texel. You know, if you want the texel, raise the texel. Um, if you're a high country farm and you're cut off, you're on an even playing field with everybody else around. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is an adaptation to specific considerations which are fairly unique to this area. But it's a really interesting approach, really interesting use of hybridization and terminal hybrid crosses to meet needs that could not be met other ways. And then the low country farms, they're also maintaining herds of pure texel and pure long wool so that they can sell males up to tier one and tier two. Okay. There have been, like, Scottish blackface have been imported and the North American Scottish Blackface Association has made some attempts at trying to get a three-tier system to kind of catch on here. It just doesn't really make enough sense. It just hasn't caught on. It's not that it's a bad idea. It just hasn't caught on because we don't have a large number of farms that would count as tier one, mm -hmm. right? In North America, everything that would count as tier one is public land and just like game lands and state forest and um, state parks and things like that. Right? We don't have people farming on land that that's, that's, that's that poor. We do have a lot of tier two type land that's in farming. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, But it just doesn't make the same economic sense here than it does at in, in Northern England because we have a different land tenure system than they do in, in Northern England, right? Um, so, you know, that's the, that's, that's the key difference. But it is a really interesting example of a creative use of hybridization. And think about your environment, think about where you are, think about your demands and your challenges. It might just be that some other multi-tier system would make sense for you and your community and your greater area, even if it has nothing to do with sheep, right? It's, it's worth contemplating. So I hope that this has helped. Um, again, this is the fourth installment in the series. I'm going to put links to some of the technical information down in the description box. And I'll make sure that the end screen has a link to the playlist in which this appears. Um, this pretty much concludes the general information. I do have some specifics that I want to talk about, specific breeding programs, some specific animal and plant species that I want to do a deep dive in, and we'll work through those as the years progress and I have chances to visit some farms that are doing some really amazing things. And um, One other thing I'm going to put in the playlist is a recent video I did on apples talks more about the apple hybrid swarm. So since I mentioned that here in this video, I will put that as the fifth video in that playlist. So I hope that this has been useful to you. I hope that you will continue to join in if you've enjoyed it and you give it a thumbs up. I would be most grateful because it helps the algorithm know to show it to other folks. And I hope that you will benefit from this as you're thinking through your own breeding projects and join us next time here at Old Ways Rising.